My name is Julia Olmsted, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight and welcome you. Um, I first want to thank our sponsors tonight, um, who are the Bioethics Program, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Miller Lecture Fund, the Sustainable Agriculture Graduate Program, and the World Affairs Series, which is funded by the government of the student body. Um, I also want to remind you to check our website for upcoming talks um, and to let you know about a couple of, of schedule changes in some of our upcoming talks. On November 8th, this has been rescheduled for November 8th, is a, the U.S. Latinos lecture, Making it in a Globalized Workforce and Economy. And uh, the Enron story has been rescheduled for Thursday, November 10th. Um, we also want to point out that there are two remaining lectures in the World Affairs series coming up um, in the spring. The first is Noam Chomsky on April 11th, and the second is Stephen Rapp, who will be discussing International War Crimes Tribunal in Rwanda, and that's April 12th. Uh, and after the talk tonight, we will have a reception with Dr. Shiva, and uh, she will be signing books over there. So be sure to stick around. We'll also have a question and answer series. Um, so I want to welcome you all to tonight's lecture. I'm a student in the graduate program in sustainable agriculture. I'm also a member of the committee on lectures. And I know that I speak for everybody in my graduate program when I say that it is a great opportunity and a great, great honor to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Dr. Shiva is a physicist by training. She's also the founder and director of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Natural Resource Policy in India. She's the author of several books, most recently Earth Democracy, Justice, Sustainability, and Peace. And she is one of the leaders of the International Forum on Globalization. And in 1993, she was awarded the Wright Livelihood Award, which is also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. I could go on and on listing the credentials of our speaker tonight, but in my opinion, I think the best way to convey the breadth and impact of her work is to say that Dr. Shiva is a revolutionary. And I really hope that her presence here in Iowa tonight inspires us all to do something that I believe she once said, which is to think globally and act globally, and that we all join her in working for a more just society and world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shiva. Thank you to everyone who's worked to bring me here, to the many, many, many sponsors who I would never remember the whole list of. Um, uh, and thank you all for being here on Halloween night instead of giving <laughs> tips and treats at home. Uh, it's also Diwali, a wonderful festival for us at home in India, um, the Festival of Lights. So happy Diwali too. Um, I'd like to uh, actually, you know, just having, you know, a wonderful dinner at Kali's place this evening and having this stream of young kids coming in for their treats, never for the trick, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I was just thinking to myself while sitting quietly for five minutes, uh, that in a way, what we've seen happen over the last 500 years, one can say, is uh, three major tricks played on humanity that have left us that much less human and that have uh, also taken away ecological space from our non-human kindred. Um, the first trick is what came to be known as uh, the idea of terra nullius, the empty earth when the Europeans set out to colonize other lands, they merely had to use a criteria of were they Christians or not, were they European or not, which meant everything outside Europe was available to be grabbed. And uh, did they use the land as the Europeans did or did they not? And we are talking about the period when the enclosures of the commons had already started in Europe, where what that which belonged to society at large 
and for the commoner, where a commoner was free to apply their labor to land and make a living and have a livelihood. Suddenly that land was a raw material to provide fiber for industry, wool. And later when it moved on to cotton, then the whole world was raw material provider. And the idea of terra nullius really basically said, the earth is empty if you're not exploiting it in the way the industrial system exploits it. And I'd like to just share with you uh, repeatedly, I remember in the, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica till literally quite recent editions, they talked about um, the Aboriginal people of Australia as being part of the fauna and flora because they actually lived ecologically on their land and their territories. And to not be against nature, to not be against ecosystems, to not be at war with ecosystems, was defined as not being human. To be human was defined really in terms of devastating the land you took over. For the Native Americans here, it was said, well, you know, they don't really know how to farm because they don't enclose the land. They don't torture their animals. And therefore, we can take their land away. And it's very interesting because you have this huge debate right now on um, the criteria for Supreme Court judges being uh, a particular kind of philosophy. We call it constructivism. But I've, d I've done some readings about where does this come from. And repeatedly, the language used is of the takings. When private property is not the category through which we live with the resources of the earth, when we think and live through public systems, whether they be community systems as the commons, or they be public systems like public utilities, institutions like universities, educational systems, health systems, that is defined as a taking because the original right is defined as private ownership. Except that since most vital resources, the land, <coughs> rivers, the ocean, the atmosphere, have been the commons, have been in the public domain, in fact, what is defined as taking is that which allowed everyone to have access through public systems. And enclosures is defined as a right. And enclosures and the idea of the empty earth go together. Because the empty earth allows you to define enclosures as progress, as the next step. There's a second amazing idea that has preoccupied me for the last 20 years, 21 years actually. Um, and it's what I called, that trick was the trick of the monoculture of the mind. Um, and I really came across this while trying to get to the roots of the violence in Punjab in 19. Um, it was a period where we had extremism and terrorism. The entire state was riddled by, with violence that took, in my count, 30,000 lives. A terrorism which straight away is sixfold more than 9-11. Um, terrorism which was presented later as if it was a religious conflict. But it could not be two simple reasons. In the state of Punjab, the dominant religion is that of the Sikhs, which is quite a recent religion, actually. You know, you know the, the Sikhs who have the turban as one <coughs> identification. But the interesting thing is that even in the Hindu families of Punjab, they will always give the oldest boy to Sikhism. Because Sikhism came as as an organized response. I mean, Guru Nanak was the founder and he tried to break out of all religious um, 
you know, ideologies in order to actually provide a spiritual path beyond Muslim Islam, beyond Hinduism. But later, Sikhism was organized really as a way of being able to fight earlier the Mughals and then the British. And that's why the five identifications were really an identification of a low-cost barefoot army. And every family in Punjab is an overlap of Sikhism and Hinduism. There's no need to divide. So you can't have a conflict of the kind that was presented. But the other reason why it was not a religious conflict was if you looked at what was happening, who was killed? The manager of the Bhakra Dam, which Nehru had called the Temple of Modern India. The manager of the seed farm of the Agriculture University. The manager of new canal systems that were going to take water out of Punjab. People who were managing the prices of agricultural commodities. This was not a communal conflict as it was presented. And it was easy to present it as that after the Golden Temple was attacked in June, and then two of the six security guards of India were Gandhi killed her in return. And then we had this program against the six where thousands of six were killed in an Empire backlash. And we've just had some recent hearings about that 20 year old tragedy. Um, our society hasn't overcome it. But by the time I'd finished, you know, for me, this became too big a puzzle. Punjab is the most prosperous state, land of the Green Revolution. Norman Borough was given a Nobel Peace Prize for bringing peace through prosperity, uh, prosperity brought through technologies of, associated with the Green Revolution, which are really chemical agriculture. And yet this land of, supposedly the land of peace was the land at war. And I had to answer to myself, what's going on? Why isn't Punjab the prosperous state, a peaceful state? Why aren't they experiencing prosperity? So I did this longish study and wrote the book called The Violence of the Green Revolution. And that's the time when I realized that there's a way in which we can trick our minds through a monoculture. And even while we destroy systems, even while we undo productivity, <coughs> even while we produce less, we can actually pretend we are producing more. Um, if you look at the Green Revolution, it was about wheat and rice. But Punjab used to grow 250 crops before the Green Revolution. The pulses, the oil seeds, um, the staple of Punjab is actually corn. You don't see corn in Punjab anymore. Makki ki roti and sarso ka saag is the, is the cultural dish. There is no makki anymore. You have one monoculture of wheat in one season and then a monoculture of rice, except one pocket of Punjab, which is now a monoculture of first hybrid cotton and now BT cotton. Talk a little about that later. The monoculture of the mind actually goes hand in hand with that earlier myth, that earlier trick of terra nullius. Because if the earth is not a full earth, if the earth is not inhabited by diverse beings, diverse species, diverse cultures, and you've defined it as empty unless it's reproducing the monoculture through which those in power gain, then the empty earth needs monocultures. Then everyone must farm in the same way. Everyone must dress in the same way. Everyone must eat in the same way. And therefore, it's not an accident that as the earth gets emptied in the mind, it's also then reproduced as a monoculture. So you have the current situation of I guess we are sitting in the heartland of where the idea that the world's staples need, can be reduced to corn and soya is quite an amazing idea. Because soya has never been a staple food for anybody. 
fermented soya like tofu has been an East Asian dish. But no one ate soya flour. No one ate, cooked their food in soya oil till after the war. And here's something of just 30, 40 years history has become in most countries the highest consumed item, whether it's via cattle or directly. And when my colleagues in Europe were trying to launch their movements for the GMO free food, and they wanted to ban pro products which had soya because soya was the er among the early genetically engineered products, they were in for a state of shock because something like 90% foods on supermarket shelves had soya ingredients. You couldn't get away from it. Um, 1998, we had this huge cyclone in um, Urissa. It was called the Urissa super cyclone. Um, I don't think we, we need to call them super cyclones anymore because that's the only way we're getting there. <laughs> Everything is super. Um, and look at the number of visits you've had from hurricanes. And uh, the only thing I object to uh, is the fact that more often than not, they give them women's names. <laughs> Why are they all these Wilmas and Katrinas? I mean, I, and now they're running out of women's names, so they're going to beta. But you know, even the Greek alphabet has a limit. So when they run out of it all, I suggest they should start beginning with Bush 1, Bush 2, Bush 3. <laughs> <laughs> Because after all, these super cyclones are a result of enclosing the atmosphere. Some, you know, some friends say when I talk about privatization, say, oh, so you're suggesting that they've privatized <coughs> the biodiversity through patenting, they've privatized water, and then they'll pri privatize the air. I said, that's already been privatized. Because when you pump your pollution into a common atmosphere, and that enclosure through pollution takes lives away in Orissa, um, you are actually, in effect, privatizing the air. Well, the super cyclone of Orissa also killed 30,000 people. And um, when I, we were distributing seeds, and this peasant came out of his hut and said, we want to eat rice, and they're giving us this strange mixture which we cannot eat. So I said, what is it? And he brought this sack out. And of course, it had this wonderful hand, you know, the US food aid, you know, shaking hands. And uh, he said, we just can't eat this stuff. So I said, give me a sample. And um, I sent the sample uh, for testing. And of course, it was genetically engineered corn soya blend. I wrote off to our Prime Minister wrote up to the Health Ministry. <coughs> Immediately they banned the imports. Um, I wrote off to the agencies that were distributing it, which are CARE and the Catholic Relief Services. And they are required to not buy locally. They are required <coughs> to take the food, which is bought actually from the companies with tax money. It's not food aid. It's a food market created through emergency. And if you look at the number of emergencies being created, it's a growing market. In fact, it's a huge debate in the World Trade Organization right now about whether US food aid is distorting the functioning of markets by capturing such a huge section through this tied aid. Um, Care and Catholic Relief Services said they don't look at the content, they just deliver what they get. The US Embassy wrote back and said, we are not worried about bringing this here because we feed it to our own people. <coughs> so why should Indians be worried about eating GM coir, soya and corn when all the Americans are? Well, the Indian victims were worried and they refused to consume this after it was found out that it was genetically engineered. Uh, after this, two shiploads of GM corn soya was sent by the US, and the government of India did not allow it to land. They said, unless you can guarantee that it's GM free, and we don't have a very radical policy about genetic engineering, 
but even a non-radical government could take those kind of steps. We've got, of course got governments like Zambia, which put their foot down during the drought uh, in 2002 and said, sorry, you want to give us food aid, give us GM-free corn, but you cannot force, force feed us using our crisis. Um, uh, this situation where 98% of the crops that are produced today through genetic engineering are just these four crops, one of them not eaten, cotton, um, canola, <coughs> corn, soya, and the seeds of these crops are being sold by just one company in the majority of cases around the world. And four countries account for 93% of all GM crops cultivated. It is, in a way, showing that the monoculture of the mind has become dysfunctional. But of course, there's many more, uh, more feedbacks if we were only able to take the feedbacks to recognize that the monoculture of the mind is dysfunctional. Well, there's a third trick, a trick that goes by various names called globalization, sometimes called free trade, but it's neither globalization nor free trade. It's not globalization because it hasn't left us with a lovely global village um, while waiting to be picked up by Julia this evening and trying to follow up with news, thinking they might talk a bit about the bombings we've just had three days ago in India. Uh, but the whole news was, you know, just the new Supreme Court nominee. Uh, and the rest of it was all about US jobs. Yeah? Whether it's the new H-1B visas or, um, or the new bankruptcy laws that are shutting down small businesses and individual <coughs> entrepreneurship, which accounts for, from the figures, 50% employment in this country. Globalization hasn't allowed the information technologists of this world to think of each other as one wonderful community. They see each other as, as competitors, as being at war. Um, talk to information technologists in this country, they are not very happy about the outsourcing to India because they see it as a theft of their jobs. Um, and this is the more visible, more direct relocation of jobs. In very many circumstances, the new, new divides that we experience are, uh, are actually very much related to this phenomenon of trying to integrate the world not as a living system populated by diverse cultures and diverse species, that's the full earth. That's terra madre. But really, the world as Walmart. The world which only has two ends to it. You suck out products at very low cost prices from somewhere. And the only way you can make that happen is extracting resources way faster than their renewability and paying people lower wages than they need. I mean, if even India, and India's levels of poverty you know, but even India's wages are considered too high now in the globalized economy. Indian businesses are moving to China to cut costs. So you can imagine what's happening. I mean, compare yourselves to China, it's different. India, you know, we've had these huge scandals of um, um, our fireworks industry, which was based on child labor. Well, even child labor is too costly now. The firework industry has moved to China because there's something cheaper than child labor there. I personally don't know how it all works. It's, it's quite a mystery. But that end, cheap produce. In the case of manufacture, Walmart is brilliant. In the case of agriculture, um, the Global Trade Treaty, the Agriculture Agreement in WTO, which has ended up in being in total deadlock right now, 
It should have been in deadlock in 1993, when the US and Europe actually agreed to s settle a deal and push this on the rest of the world. But this free trade treaty of agriculture is anything but free. Anything but free because it would not be able to run without the machinery of distorted subsidies. And that's why countries are not willing to give up their subsidies. And the southern countries keep asking for subsidies to be given up because free trade means non-subsidized trade. But you know, Cargill could not grab the world's markets without help from your money to enable the US government to dump at prices lower than the cost of production. And in the decade of the World Trade Organization agreements being in place, we've had an increase of rates of dumping to 50%, 50%. Especially in cotton, which led to the total collapse in Cancun, because tiny African countries were losing $250 million a year because of the 40 billion US, sub, uh, 4 billion dollar US subsidy to the cotton growers here. You know, you shouldn't even call them growers because I think growers are those who work in processes of ecological and biological growth. I don't think we should use the term growers for absentee landlords, for banks, for corporations who are fictions. Because they can't grow anything. They can grow fictions. You know, they can grow huge fictitious money on the casino, on the global casino, and they can make three trillion dollars move around the world, which is 60 times more than all the goods and services available on the planet. So that as you move that money into a few hands, those few hands then want to grab the healthcare of every country, the agriculture of every country, the seeds of every farmer, the water in every river, and it's not an accident that globalization, as we see it, can only go through with privatization of the common resources of the people <coughs> of the world. Those resources which every law, every jurisprudence, every practice of the world have said, has said are so vital to survival that they cannot be owned privately the banks of rivers, the beaches, the coasts, the forests in many places. Those commons, their privatization is an absolutely intrinsic part of what is called globalization. And if we really think only of globalization as a phenomena of linking people, we miss two points about it. The first point we miss is it's delinking people. It is not just separating us, but it is turning us into enemies. And that's why when we get the World Trade Organization, when you get NAFTA, and you they attempt to give you CAFTA, that's the time you get a Samuel Hunt Huntington able to talk about clash of civilizations. <clears throat> because civilizations are things that cannot clash. They're too big. Civilizations are too generous. Civilizations give you moorings for who you are. They cannot generate within themselves the levels of insecurity that the so-called clash cultures takes. But what I love about the issue of civilization is really Gandhi's quote, you know, when he'd gone to England to negotiate our freedom, and someone asked him, what do you think of Western civilization? And he thought for a moment and said, it wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, the idea of the West based on empty lands and therefore taking over other cultures, other resources, that it wasn't a civilized way of being in the world. Yeah. It was a barbaric way of being in the world. And yet it had defined that barbarism <coughs> as being civilized mm -hmm. and other civilizations as being barbaric. And through that very convenient switch, um, you know, everything that followed happen, except that what's happening today is in a way a return to that crude, primitive accumulation of that barbaric times. If you look at the work on water privatization, for example, it's all guided 
by celebrating the cowboy economy of grab a river and then sell the water to the gold rush. And book after book has come out of the right-wing think tanks in this country, which is then used to try and get our people to think that way. That basically, water should be owned as private property, and whoever can grab it, whoever can grab a river, should have the right to sell it. And community rights are coming in the way. Riparian rights are coming in the way. They've got to be wiped out. We've just had a report put out by the World Bank on India's water economy. Of course, they don't talk of India's water culture, which we've had. They don't talk about India's water ecology, which we need. They talk about India's water economy, and of course, before you know it, economy has gone from basic needs to water markets controlled by the big corporate giants. And the bank normally used to talk about the state, about the government, and you know, needing markets in place of the state. But now it's talking about needing markets in place of community. It's basically saying, we will have to, within the next decade, move people out of self-provisioning and self-organization of their water systems. 80% of India's water is managed by communities. 80%. And they say, no, this will have to change. Because a community managing its water system means there's no market. It's a resource communities conserve. They build the tanks. They use the water. They decide democratically how the water will be used. They decide what will not be done with water. In a dry area, you cannot grow sugar cane. In a water scarce area, you cannot pollute your river. So they do not allow sugar cane farming. They do not allow industrial uh, exploitation of water, including pollution. Um, and interestingly, the bank then also always, you know, the other thing that goes, and maybe we could call Mod, mod, modernity, another trick. Because you can just use modern anytime you want for anything at all, which is another way of the right to grab. So the World Bank talks about modern water systems. Tanks that have lasted a thousand years, two thousand years, to me are very modern systems. Because if they did not die out, they're contemporary. They're here in this moment. If they're contemporary, they're modern. That is the temporal definition of what is modern. But there's a political definition of what's modern. And that political definition of what's modern is really that which legit legitimizes the current alliances of power. And a modern water system, in their view, is super dams and long distance canal transfers. So they've used a figure that US, you all have per capita water storage in dams of 5,000 cubic meters per capita. India only has 200 cubic meters per capita. Now that's another trick, very nice little trick. Um, first, because you have a smaller population, we are a billion. So you can always reduce a large number to a small number by dividing it by a billion. <laughs> The second trick is you only count the water in large dams, which is a very tiny percentage of the stored water. Most of India's water is stored in rivers, underground, in the soil, and in systems made by local communities. They're much smaller in size, but much larger in storage, if you add it all up. So I did a figure, I did a quick calculation to respond to the bank report. If we were to go from 200 to the 5,000 figure, and the 200 has already submerged and displaced 40 million people since the large dam started to get financed by the World Bank, that's 25 times increase in mega dams. We would then have to displace 25 times more than the 40 million, just do the calculation, that's a billion of us. There will be no Indian people left in the world. That idea of large dam building had to take place back again to the empty earth. There are no people. You can build dams because that earth is empty. Displacement doesn't matter. Turning people homeless doesn't matter. The failure of dams, of course, doesn't matter at all because one thing that um, 
that the idea of the empty earth does is it allows the colonizer to always feel they're improving. They never have to justify improvement. They never have to evaluate comparisons. And that is so conspicuous, particularly in agriculture. Now, just like 80% of India's water systems are self-managed, 80% of India's seed supply is self-provided. It's farmers' varieties of crops so diverse that I am still keeping up with, you know, and catching up with the diversity that our farmers grow. We used to have 200,000 rice varieties. Navdanya, the organization I started to save seeds, has rescued about three, 4,000 varieties. Varieties that are 18 feet tall in the flood areas and can rise and shrink according to the flood waters. They're harvested from boats, especially in Bihar and Bengal. Varieties that are resistant to salt along the coastal areas. We distributed those in the Orissa cyclone. Just, I just took, after the tsunami, I took two truckloads from our seed banks in Orissa to the Tamil Nadu tsunami affected areas because the sea had brought so much salt water that unless the farmers called salt, salt resistant rice varieties, they wouldn't have been able to get a crop for the next few years. Um, varieties, uh, aromatic varieties like the basmati, and varieties uh, of wheats, uh, wheats in central India, which are still dry land wheats, they are growing, uh, they have as much as 16% uh, protein. Um, delicious, very, very tasty. And today, in the areas which were not transformed by Ioban plant breeding, those rices, the old rices, uh, old rices and the old wheats bring farmers two to three times the price of the Green Revolution varieties. Because the Green Revolution varieties have uh, no nutrition. They have no taste. Even their weight is a very temporary weight because if you keep the rice or wheat in your home after harvest for two days, they've already dropped 10% weight because soil moisture. So you farmers go see which day will the market buy. Then they come back and thresh and rush in order to get that 10% margin. Um, now in agriculture, which has managed to, uh, to reduce the diversity to two or three crops, you know, five crops are accounting for all the food we eat now. Five crops. And I do festivals. We do festivals with, and usually with older women who still know how to cook. And on any festival, we will have 150 to 200 plants being used in the cooking. We did one with just greens the other day. Every dish had 15 to 20 greens in it. Every farm in India, if it is still managed by women, has 250 plants that grow. 250 plants that grow. And I am now doing a series of studies on the productivity of these farms. They are 10, 20, 100 times higher than the most intensively industrial system. Why doesn't that buy? Productivity get counted because of the monoculture of the mind. We can only look at one commodity at a time. It cannot look at the complexity of a home garden where you've got a palm tree and the pepper vine and you've got the areca nut and you've got the um, cardamom, you've got the bananas in between and it, you know, you, you've used every space in three-dimensional form to maximize photosynthesis with every ray of sunlight. Every inch is covered by crops. Um, averages of 100, 200, 300 species and varieties on each farm. All of the dominant thinking in agriculture has assumed that diversity gets in the way of producing more. 
You have to get rid of diversity because monocultures give you more. I do not think we've had a trick worse than that because monocultures have deprived us of biodiversity, they have destroyed cultural diversity, but most importantly, they have created hunger and they have created poverty. Because all that lost diversity we are not calculating and what little grows, we think it is so disturbing that you've got to spray it with Roundup. Um, and you know, Roundup has become the best, biggest liberator of the monoculture of the mind. I, I remember one of the negotiations of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the, uh, Monsanto had bro brought out a booklet called Feeding the Eight Billion. And, uh, and then I had to quickly, you know, in these processes, you have to kind of literally think on your feet and bring out a counter booklet overnight. And uh, I, I brought out a booklet about how this meant starving because if all you had was rows of soya bean spraying round up, you were losing 90% of the potential of food production on small farms in the third world. It was not an increase of nutrition, it was not an increase of agriculture. It was actually a decline in nutrition, besides being a decline in, um, in employment, in livelihoods. Um, you know, when, when you had NAFTA and they started to dump corn on, the, on Mexico, they kept saying, oh, the Chiapas only produces two tons of corn acre. But a Chiapas farm produced 20 tons of food, which was not corn not only corn. And by only focusing on corn, you were able to then destroy 98% of the nutrition of the local communities, which eventually led, of course, to the Zapatista uprising. Um, but besides getting rid of the, uh, <coughs> the sources of nutrition, the monoculture of the mind going hand in hand with the empty earth idea is also trying to erase the culture embodied in biodiversity. Because biodiversity is not just living resources. All biodiversity that has interacted with human beings has become a reflection of culture. It speaks about culture. It speaks about the knowledge of communities, particularly of women. And the free trade idea that somehow we now will all be free to produce and trade is countered totally by an element of the trade treaties, which is intellectual property rights, which is absolutely the opposite of freedom. Because having put in Article 27.3b in the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement, and when you now hear of intellectual property, you'll hear of pharmaceuticals, you'll hear of generic drugs, you'll rarely hear about the seed issue. But the real driving force for bringing intellectual property into a trade treaty was to control the genetic wealth of the world. And after this whole intellectual property agreement was put in place, we saw another phenomenon, a phenomenon of taking over the knowledge of other cultures and declaring it to be invention. Of course, a patent on life, in my view, is flawed from the very beginning because life is not invented. A plant is not an invention. A manipulated plant is a manipulated plant. It has not been created. You might introduce a few genes, you might do some crossbreeding, you might make a hybrid. But the ability of the plant to organize itself and reproduce itself and its properties, that ability is the plant's own self-organizing capacity. And that is what we call life. And therefore to call, to apply patents, which means the right to inventions, to that which has not been invented is flawed from the very beginning. But it's doubly flawed when what's taken over has been known, innovated, used over millennia. I have fought three major cases of this phenomena which we named biopiracy. 
Um, and biopiracy, by biopiracy, I basically mean the piracy of the knowledge and biodiversity of other cultures. The first case we started actually only got decided this year. We started it in 1984. The same year as the year of Punjab was the year of Bhubal, when 30,000 people have been killed in that horrible disaster linked to the, uh, um, the leak of the pesticide plant. On 8th of March this year, uh, we won a case. We are on the appeal in a case in which we'd already won the case in the year 2000. And this case was against the United States government and W.R. Grace. W.R. Grace used to be one of your big chemical companies. And jointly with the U.S. government, Department of Agriculture, they had claimed to have invented the use of neem in agriculture. Now, I started the neem campaign in 1984 at the time of Bhopal. So to see 10 years later the right to invention of that which my mother has used, grandmothers used, we use it for skin diseases, we use it as the village toothbrush, we use it in our fields. Uh, suddenly, it was now an invention, so we challenged it. And I had to join, of course, with uh, friends in Europe, two other women, one who was uh, the president of the Greens in the European Parliament at that time, Magda, and the president of EFOM, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. And three of us fought that case together over 11 years. And on 8th of March, on International Women's Day, we were sitting in this court in Munich, and uh, the appeals board basically rules in our favor. And I said, thank you so much. You couldn't have given us a bigger gift on Women's Day. Um, but 11 years of challenging, two major forces. And it wasn't the only case. The other case was Basmati. My valley, I come from Dehradun, um, and we are very famous for our Dehradun-y Basmati. So when you see, in, in an Indian store, you will see rice, you will see Dehradun-y Basmati. It might not come from Dehradun, but it's a good way to sell Basmati, because the best Basmati comes from Dehradun. It's the most authentic. So again, I've grown up with Basmati. I've, we grew it on our farm. We've conserved it. You walk. You know, if basmati is growing at the end of the hall, you will smell it here, even from the leaves when we transplant it. Um, and so 1998, we find out Rice Tech, a Texas company, claims to have invented our basmati in Neradu, sitting in Texas. <laughs> Something must be funny about Texas soil. <laughs> they want the oil of Iraq, they want the basmati of Neradun. And the company is called Rice Tech. Basmati means the queen of aroma. Now they turn it into tech, you know. They just put tech, just like they put modern and it's all good. They put tech and it's all brilliant. It's a new invention. So you will be getting in your stores, they call it Texmati. Basmati has been renamed Texmati. It sounds so ugly because Mati means queen. Now it's queen of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and the patent claim had the height of the plant, the length of the grain, the aroma in the grain, even methods of cooking. And my mother taught me how to cook rice when I was a six-year-old. Even methods of cooking they have invented for the first time. <laughs> methods of cooking rice. So we fought that one for eight years, and eventually most of the clauses had to be withdrawn, partly with a wonderful campaign I, I, my only trip to Texas was to fight this battle. And I asked local groups to organize a talk, and I found a church where old, older women were willing to come and protest with me at the Rice Tech head, of, head offices. And then we organized a postcard campaign. And the postcard campaign was basically to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, that's what it's called, USPTO. And we had to send these postcards and the postcards basically said, we'll have to rename you the US Piracy and Theft Office <laughs> if you do not stop granting patents of this kind and don't remove the Basmati patent. Uh, so that was the second victory. 
The third one, I mean, ev everyone, it shrinks. The time it takes for us to prove theft shrinks. February of last year, we find this patent where Monsanto claims invention of a rice which in the text of the patent they say they've, of a wheat they've taken from India. And it's a very low elasticity wheat. You know, partly because of the kind of industrial breeding. The breeding of wheats has forced wheat to become very elastic, the flour to become very elastic. Because with all this machinery and everything, you know, you really need heavily elastic flour to deal with all that violence. <laughs> Our wheels are very low elasticity, and because of that high elasticity, which is linked to high gluten content, there's a lot of gluten allergy now. But also to make crisp things out of elastic wheat means you have to add a lot of chemicals to bring crispness. And given the health consciousness, there's a new market for chemical-free crispness. Now, that chemical-free crispness survives because of traditional breeding by Indian farmers. So when we found this case again, we challenged it. We challenged in February by eight, September, the patent had been revoked. But can you imagine if we had not had the energy, the guts, to take on these big powers and take on this assumption that life could be patented, other people's culture could be patented, when people would go down to say, give us this day our daily bread, it would be a prayer to Monsanto. <laughs> now, of course, out of all this struggle and out of all this challenging of these tricks, we've had our treats. We've had wonderful treats because I, you know, I'm, I'm a physicist. I should have been just solving quantum theory equations all my life. And I would have been delighted with it and I'd never have got bored. You know, a physicist never gets bored. We're doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> but you know, 1984, I have all these experiences of Bhopal and Punjab and, and I cannot deal with an agriculture that is so violent that it is killing people, killing the earth, wiping out biodiversity, destroying our food. So I start doing things I've never been trained for, just because I believe in them. First thing I do is start saving seeds. And I start saving seeds to not allow patenting of seeds. So when they bring patents and they bring the new seed laws that make it illegal for farmers, we do what we have prepared to do, which is to say what Gandhi said to the British when they wanted to own salt. And, you know, They wanted to prevent Indians from making salt, and he went to Dandi Beach, picked up the salt, so we get it for free from nature, we'll continue to make it. And we said the same about seed. We said we get it from our ancestors, we get it from nature, we will continue to grow our seeds, save them, and exchange them. We will not allow seed saving and seed exchange to be defined as criminal acts of intellectual property theft, because it is our duty. We call this the bead satyagraha the non-cooperation with seed patent laws. And I handed over to our Prime Minister this year on 2nd of March, pledges of five million peasants in India to say, you can change all the laws you want to change, but for us, seed will stay common property. Our duty to save and exchange will stay higher than your laws. And we will never cooperate with laws that criminalize our highest ecological duties and our highest acts of ethical sharing with each other. Because if farmers cannot save seeds, and if farmers cannot exchange seed, there is no future of agriculture. There is no food security. Especially in times of dramatic disasters, there is no way to be able to tap the diversity which we need, to be able to continue to adapt to changing climates and changing contexts. The second treat that I have really you know, del been delighted with is the fact that when we started to do seed saving, we then had to do organic farming because you, know, you can't save native seeds and do chemical agriculture and spray around them. It doesn't work. So we had to start doing organic farming. And as we did organic farming, the farmers then said, it's no point us growing this stuff. Now you've got to help us sell, sell it. So we had to start fair trade. I had to start opening outlets. And then the consumers came around and said, 
or you bring all these wonderful grains, but we don't know how to cook with amaranth, and we don't know how to cook with ragi. So now you've got to teach us. So we started opening cafes and cooking classes. We even have cooking classes for little kids because Indian, the urban elite in India is going the US way. In the last five years, 14% of our children are obese and have diabetes, adult diabetes. So we're working with them to say, you know, here's healthy food, you can do it yourself. You don't have to kill yourself at age 15 by eating junk just because you're made to believe through advertising that this is the ultimate way to live on planet Earth. You know, one chomp one package of Frito-Lay chips and then drink a Pepsi or Coke bottle. Uh, kids have been reduced to turn that as their staple food. Now to work with children from that age onwards is an amazing treat because they adopt very quickly. They immediately start appreciating the quality of food. Um, in regions where we work and where we work with farmers, farmers' incomes are three to four times higher than the highest cash crop regions in the country. Growing food they need and selling a bit of it. Selling their real surpluses, which is the other magic of biodiversity. That it, doesn't, it isn't either or, it isn't subsistence versus cash crops. It isn't having food security or being able to have a marketable income. You can have both. You can grow everything you need, you can grow for the earth, you can grow for the family, and then you can grow surpluses for the market. But the market doesn't have to eat into your food security, and it definitely doesn't have to eat into your ecological security. It's a very rough calculation. Ragi, this amazing um, millet, Elucine Kurakana, you know, it uses 300 millimeters of water. And if we were to go out of the monoculture of the mine, out of the monoculture of intensively irrigated chemical padding to ragi, we would have 400 times more nutrition with the same land and water. Yeah. We are giving up options of nutrition, options of providing very high quality food to the poorest of people. And of course, a major dis distraction is now the empty food <coughs> of the genetically engineered route, where instead of um, nutrition, what we have a few toxics added and a few um, you know, ha hazardous genes added, and uh, it's all declared safe because you had another vice president who I only remember as the man who could never spell potato. <laughs> <laughs> Quail. Well, Dan Quail was used by the senior President Bush immediately after the Rio agreements because we got the Convention on Biological Diversity through. And immediately after that, a new directive was put out by the, you know, for the Food and Drug Administration, which is called the, it's now known in scientific literature as the substantial equivalence principle that assume substantial equivalence. You can add all the genes you want, you can add all the bacteria, all the vectors, all the viruses into food and pretend there's nothing there. Maybe another version of terra nullius, actually. You empty out the toxic hazards, you empty out the genetic hazards of genetically modified food. But we don't have to go that way because there is known advantages to high quality food produced through ecological systems. And th what is amazing about putting biodiversity at the center of our thinking of food and agriculture, we don't just protect the web of life, we don't just protect all species. Through agriculture, we actually create ecological niches for species to return. Our farm in Dehradun, I have watched in the last 10 years while we've um, conserved, we grow a thousand crops there. Every year we get new kinds of butterflies. Every year we get new beneficial insects. Every year we get new medicinal plants that were assumed to be extinct. You just create the right hospitable climate and the rest evolution does for itself. We merely have to be good citizens of the earth and we create space for other earth citizens by our right action. We conserve nature. We conserve livelihoods. 
because when you give up chemically intensive agriculture, you go towards biologically intensive agriculture. Biologically intensive agriculture replenishes diversity and replenishes lively and replenishes lively and replenishes lively. 